Joel, thanks so much for coming on the show. Remarkably, in this podcast, you do feature an interview with Justice Thomas's mother, Miss Leola Williams. Before we learn that Harlan Crow owned her home, uh, let's have a listen to a small bit of that conversation. Oh, yeah, you got all the Supreme Court pictures. Man, that was, yeah, man, you've got a lot of history in here, Miss Leola. Yep. There's a graduation picture, a picture of them together greeting First Lady Barbara Bush. And then there's a family shot. But Clarence isn't in that one. He was tied up in Washington, D.C. And you see this picture up here where we was at my cousin's house in, in Pinpoint. And the vote came down. We was all in there. We were praying. Joe, can you tell us a little bit about... A little bit more about what it was like speaking with Clarence Thomas's mother in that house and why she was willing to speak with you. Yeah, I mean, thanks. first of all, thanks for having me on. Uh, I think the amazing thing is I pull up on the street. This is East 32nd Street in Savannah. Um, and I didn't, there was nobody out front. There was no security. And I, I think that the most surprising thing that I was able to just get to the front porch uh, with, <laughs> with nobody stopping me and I knock on the door um, I believe her great grand, her great granddaughter in law answers the door and they welcomed me in. And the only way, the way that I, only way that I can make sense of this is that nobody does that. Um, they probably have not had a reporter knock on their door in many, many years. Um, and in fact, a, f a friend of mine who had spoken to this family before, they said, Hey, look, the only way that you're going to get them is if you go down to Savannah and show up. And so that, that is what I did. And I can't, I can't imagine that many people have, would have even thought that it was possible. And I didn't either. I did not think that I was going to get a chance to speak with her, but, um, I knocked on the door and she welcomed me in. And I think that, you know, just, I was very upfront about what the reasons I was there. Um, you know, I tried to be very complimentary of her in the home. It's a very lovely home, a very modest home, but still uh, well-preserved. And she just welcomed me in. And I think that just, it was just sort of disarming. I, I think if they'd had a chance to tell me to not come, they probably would have. But when you show up, it's kind of hard to turn somebody away from your front door. A home now owned by Harlan Crow, I should point out. You make the case that Clarence Thomas was the beneficiary of affirmative action, despite the fact that he spent his entire career opposing it. Uh, at the time of us speaking right now, we're still waiting for the affirmative action case uh, opinion from the Supreme Court. Explain to our viewers briefly how Clarence Thomas, this anti-affirmative action conservative, benefited from affirmative action himself. Well, I, so we can really start back um, when he leaves the seminary. His, he spends his first year of college at a seminary in Missouri, and he drops out after experiencing some uh, recent racist incidents there and he's looking for a place to go to school. This is 1968. Just in the months after the assassination of Martin Luther King, Holy Cross starts ramping up a program to welcome black students onto campus. And so that first class in the fall of 1968 welcomes more black students than have ever been at the school in, the, in its history. Uh, and Clarence Thomas was one of those people. So he benefits there. He uh, enrolls at Yale Law School in 1971. This is the first explicit year that Yale has a a racial preferences quota. So that that class in the fall of 1971 mandated that they have at least 10% minority uh, students in the class. Clarence Thomas is part of that. His first job out of college with uh, John Danforth, who at the time was the attorney general of Missouri. He was the first black person to ever work in that office. Um, and not long after that, Monsanto, he works at the chemical company after that. They're in, currently under pressure to hire more black attorneys. He benefits there. Danforth hires him again on the Capitol Hill. He's the only black person in the office. So as you can sort of see, I mean, you, and you don't need me to tell you about sort of the, the significance of him um, yeah. getting these federal court appointments, but he has always been um, benefited from racial preferences uh, throughout his career, even if he's sort of loath to admit that that's exactly how he, he's advanced. Yeah, he wants to uh, pull the drawbridge up, is the phrase I like to use uh, for people of color who do that. Many are calling Thomas uh, a hypocrite because he himself benefited from the program. Uh, but a conservative columnist in the Boston Globe defends Clarence Thomas. He admits Thomas was a beneficiary, but writes, judges are never supposed to be swayed in judgment by personal considerations or loyalties. If Thomas concludes that affirmative action is unlawful, his job is to vote against it, period. Those who attack his hypocrisy are really attacking him because he's a black man who doesn't share their view. What's your response to that? Um, I mean, I guess I, I can understand why that is a compelling argument to him. But uh, the thing is, is that, you know, Clarence Thomas, the reason that he's against affirmative action 
um, from what we can tell from reporting, is that when he was at Yale Law School, people there repeatedly uh, told him, you don't belong here. You don't deserve to be here because you've been in from affirmative action. And it hardened within him because initially he had no problem with these programs. He was actually, you know, fairly liberal on on, on, on affirmative action, race-based preferences. But at Yale, he was really ra radicalized against it because of the experience he had there. And I don't think that's, you know, I don't think that's a sufficient reason. I mean, the, 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 it, to me, I've always found it interesting that instead of being upset at the people that did not welcome him onto campus or the people that thought that he didn't deserve to be there, in spite of his, he had a very impressive academic record up until the point he went to Yale Law School, that the people that should not benefit are the people that should be punished as a result yeah. of the black people that have followed after him. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, and, you know, but, you know, Clarence Thomas, as you know, uh, from that bench, he's used his personal opinions to guide his legal opinions in a lot of different ways. So it's not surprising so, affirmative action is one of those issues. Quick last question. We're almost out of time, but I've got to ask. We played that sound of you saying, I wanted to understand why, why our journeys were so different. Did you get to the bottom of why Clarence Thomas went from being a kind of Malcolm X fanboy to being a hero of the Republican radical right? He wanted to make money. Um, <laughs> he... You know, he uh, by the time he got out of law school, he had a wife, he had a young child. He didn't have many, very many job offers. The Republicans are the ones that opened their doors to him. Uh, and he saw very quickly that I can advance professionally um, and I can go much further if I go down this pipeline as opposed to pursuing it the other way. Um, so I think it, you know, maybe that's a very cynical uh, view of it, but that's that that seems to be the most compelling evidence to me that he knew that he could make a lot of money and he could go much further uh, if he went with the people that welcomed him. Follow the money. The podcast is called Slow Burn, Becoming Justice Thomas. It's out now. Joel Anderson, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me.